Good morning and welcome to our service here at Erskine Parish Church. It's wonderful to have you tuning in and joining with us and we're thankful that you're able to do so. And as always, we pray uh, and hope for God's encouragement and help and strength as we look to him and him alone uh, later on in his word. Grateful very much so for the gents who have been able to lead us in worship, who ensured I was able to have a break and I've heard so many good things about the messages and the worship that they brought and so we are so blessed to have uh, folks who are able to step in and provide worship Um, and I had a great break so it's good to be back. Uh, In line with that though because restrictions are easing somewhat we're hoping to have more people take part regularly in these uh, worship services and so If uh, you're able and willing to do um, a reading of scripture, a prayer of intercession, um, any of those or both, please do get in touch with our worship team leader, Stuart Boyne. Be happy to hear from you. I'm going to post his email uh, address in the description below so you'll be able to get in touch with him as he's coordinating a sort of rota for that. And um, we'll have more voices and more people uh, leading in worship and give a bit more of a flavour of church like we're used to. So we commend that to you. Uh, secondly, just to intimate that if uh, since I've been away, if there's anyone who would like, you know, would like some pastoral care or you would yourself, um, please do get in touch. My contact details are on our website as well as on our various social platforms um, if you would like some pastoral contact. Uh, With that, we did, uh, last week I pre-recorded a service on Exodus 7, um, talking about the idea of God being with us. And then this week we come to another one-off in Isaiah chapter 57, as we think about how God can be so great and mighty and distant and yet near. Um, Before then, we start our new series. Next week, we'll be starting a new series in the book of Esther. Right now, I'm going to read a few verses from Scripture I hope will be relevant for our thoughts later on from the opening of Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their Saviour. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, God of Jacob. As we approach and draw near to God in worship, let's offer our prayers of confession And uh, we'll, as always, gather up our prayers in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, who dwells in unapproachable light, we are awestruck and humbled as the people of your creation to be able to call upon your name and come into your presence. We thank you, Lord, for the great privilege that is ours when we are able to do that at any time, in any place, wherever we find ourselves, whatever circumstances we find ourselves in, whatever trouble and turmoil surrounds us, whatever trouble and turmoil rages within our own hearts, we can call upon the Almighty God, the Holy One of Israel, who is Uh, disclosed himself as an ever-present help in times of trouble, as a refuge and a strength to his people. We come, O Lord, knowing that our sin separates us. By very nature, we take part in actions day by day that would create distance between ourselves and the God who we were made to know and fellowship with. As we bring these things to mind, O Lord, we ask for your forgiveness and cleansing power to move through us, to eradicate not only um, the misdeeds and the record of guilt, but also, Lord, to so cleanse our hearts and consciences that we can truly say with Paul, we are a new creation. 
Help us as we look to approach you. Give us your spirit. Hear us as we call on the words that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory now and forever. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the prophet Isaiah in the Old Testament. We're going to be reading from Isaiah chapter 57 and I'll read the whole chapter. Isaiah chapter 57. The righteous perish and no one takes it to heart. The devout are taken away and no one understands that the righteous are taken away to be spared from evil. Those who walk uprightly enter into peace. They find rest as they lie in death. But you come here, you children of a sorceress, you offspring of adulterers and prostitutes. Who are you mocking? At whom do you sneer and stick out your tongue? Are you not a brood of rebels, the offspring of liars? You burn with lust among the oaks and under every spreading tree. You sacrifice your children in the ravines and under the overhanging crags. The idols among the smooth stones of the ravines are your portion. Indeed, they are your lot. Yes, to them you have poured out your drink offerings and offered grain offerings. In view of all this, should I relent? You have made your bed on a high and lofty hill. There you went up to offer your sacrifices. Behind your doors and your doorposts you have put your pagan symbols. Forsaking me, you uncovered your bed, you climbed into it and opened wide. You made a pact with those whose bed you love and you looked with lust on their naked bodies. You went to Molech with olive oil and increased your perfumes. You sent your ambassadors far away, you descended to the very realm of the dead. You wearied yourself by such going about. But you would not say it is hopeless. You found renewal of your strength, and so you did not faint. Whom have you so dreaded and feared that you have not been true to me, and have neither remembered me nor taken this to heart? Is it not because I have long been silent that you do not fear me? I will expose your righteousness and your works, and they will not benefit you. When you cry out for help, let your collection of idols save you. The wind will carry all of them off. A mere breath will blow them away. But whoever takes refuge in me will inherit the land and possess my holy mountain. And it will be said, build up, build up, prepare the road. Remove the obstacles out of the way of my people. For this is what the high and exalted one says. He who lives forever, whose name is holy, I live in a high and holy place, but also with the one who is contrite and lowly in spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. I will not accuse them forever, nor will I always be angry, for then they would faint away because of me, the very people I have created. I was enraged by their sinful greed. I punished them and hid my face in anger. Yet they kept on in their willful ways. I have seen their ways, but I will heal them. I will guide them and restore comfort to Israel's mourners, creating praise on their lips. Peace, peace to those far and near, says the Lord, and I will heal them. But the wicked are like the tossing sea which cannot rest, whose waves cast up mire and mud. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. Amen. And we give thanks to God for this reading of his own holy and inspired word. And to his name be every praise. What is God like and where does he live? Uh, Sometimes when you're in small talk and you're striking up conversation with strangers we are familiar with trying to establish bits of information about the other person like this trying to ask questions like 
um, what are they like, what sort of person are they, what kind of things do they enjoy or not enjoy. And then quite often it's very common to ask where someone is from, um, where they live, where they grew up, that kind of thing. And we we do lots of things in that. We establish um, perhaps if we have any overlap, if there are areas that we have in common, um, if they're so exotic that it's it's someone whose life and upbringing we have no way of of, of imagining or having access to. Um, if they have any proximity to us, maybe it turns out they grew up just around the corner from us or that they really just live very close by. That kind of thing. It's, it's things that we want to know about someone we're engaged in, in conversation with. And this chapter in Isaiah if we were to ask those questions about God, they, they have a rather, it has a rather beautiful way of answering that question. What is God like and where does he dwell or where does he live? Uh, I was reading somewhat recently about um, some of the discoveries uh, made during the life of Stephen Hawking. He was an extremely prominent and gifted physicist who brought different specialties and area of physics together. And one of the things that he really did was he helped us chart what are some of the what are some of the biggest mysteries in the universe, particularly around the idea of black holes. And his work in black holes is really interesting. He helped us um, fine-tune the discovery that inside a black hole um, in space that things collapse so much than under the, the weight and the force of its own gravity that uh, space and time become somewhat relative. You and I live in a world where space and time are more or less fixed in day to day and there's not much we can do to change them. But within our universe, we've now discovered that um, there, are t there are places where that's a bit more fuzzy, the idea of space and time. And in some sense, all these discoveries about um, the universe and the cosmos, in some sense, they have been grasping at whether it's called that or not, grasping at God, grasping at the what is out there, what is the expanse of things, what is the real nature of things, what's the highest thing we can reach for. We continually do that as, as a civilization and as humanity. And it is, in a sense, grasping at God. And I think one of the saddest things about the testimony of the likes of someone like Stephen Hawking is that um, finally, they would conclude, and, and he would conclude in one of his books, that there is no need for a creator God because the universe runs on the laws of science and physics. And as somebody who, who loves the Lord and studies scripture, it's just so baffling. It just shows you that man can be so close. They can be there discovering uh, the the relativity of black holes and that time and space are starting to collapse into something that's even closer to eternity than what we know as time. And yet they can say, uh, well, as the Psalms put it, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. And it just shows us the need to know God by his spirit, to, to illuminate the knowledge of God in our own hearts. So how does Isaiah answer these questions? How do we get to the truth about who God is and where he actually is? Is, is he in, in the black holes? Um, is that ever going to get us to God? Well, what I want to do is particularly focus, focus on verse 15 um, and break down what it shows us about God himself. Verse 15, for this is what the high and the exalted one says. He who lives forever, whose name is holy, I live in a high and holy place, but also with the one who is contrite and lowly in spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. Well, let us first look at these characteristics of God, his highness, his exaltedness, uh, the fact that he sees his name as holy, and also that he who lives forever could be translated um, very closely in the Hebrew, the one who inhabits eternity. These characteristics of God, and then uh, by contrast, the characteristics in us that God says he dwells with. 
God's highness. What does he mean when he describes himself to Israel as the high and holy one? Well, Israel in the context of this writing of Isaiah is in as of much of the Old Testament is in a, a walking through a dark experience and not necessarily dark in a way that they're aware of it, but dark in terms of where they stand in relation to God. Darkness in terms of willful and blissful ignorance of God and, and having walked away more or less from the fellowship and relationship that God had called them to and made them for. It's likely written in a time of either through the exile or just after the exile where uh, exile, where national religions are a low ebb. There's, there's been a sort of, for many generations with uh, many wicked kings and the splitting up of the kingdom and the experience of exile, there's a sort of national forgetting of their roots and who they are as a people, of, of the law and the, the covenant that God had called them to. And so... In some sense, what they've ended up doing, what um, John Calvin says, is central to what we do as humans when, when we forget God. We, we produce um, idols in our own hearts, and sometimes they're external. There's a lot of references in Isaiah 57 to the fact that his God's people were, were fashioning idols for themselves to replace their relationship with God. Uh, the Isaiah 57 makes a lot more sense when you understand that a lot of the pagan religions around the Israelites at this time consisted of uh, either sexual ritual worship or certainly making some kinds of shrines to their many gods up in the highest places. There was... Um, there was the idea that the higher that you got, that the, the closer you were to holiness. And there's some truth in that, of course. There's something powerful and symbolic about the highness of God. We see that's why uh, the commandments are given, that the, the exalted revelation is given on a mountain. Jesus Christ is transfigured on a mountain. There's um, there's a sacredness, as we thought about last week, to mountains, and they can indeed be holy places. But that can cut both ways. The, the pagans having a, a sort of, let's say, a darkened or a dimmed view understanding of this. They, they see God as if through very dark spectacles or sunglasses. And with the little knowledge and distorted knowledge that they have, they would build the shrines to their false gods up in the highest places possible. And God is declaring to them, it's no good going up to your high shrines that you've made to these false gods. They're not able to save you. They're not able to do anything. And even still, go to the highest peak or pinnacle that you can to sacrifice to those gods and I am still higher again when we think of the the royal um, the common royal designation of one's highness or your highness we understand that we know that as creatures we exist in a relationship of hierarchy to other human beings and God discloses himself here as the one who is the embodiment of highness. There, there is none higher. There is none in the hierarchy of being of all that um, is animated, whether that's creatures or animals, whether that's us, the human beings who, who rule over the creation. We are still so much lower even the greatest highness on this earth, the greatest exaltedness, the greatest um, peaks that we get to, the fact that we've even put men on the moon, the fact that we're able to explore the cosmos to uh, galaxies that are billions of light years away, the fact that we can see all that, and yet we still haven't approached God's highness. And he's also exalted, and there's a slight difference in these two terms. He says he's the one who is exalted. Not only is he high in and of himself, but in relation to us, the exalted has the idea of this is the, the distance or the relationship that God has to us. And he is reminding the people that he is over them and that he is in and of himself in a continual, perfectly exalted state. There is sometimes a, a caricature of the Old Testament God 
And it comes from mixing up who God is in himself and who God reveals himself to be. God in and of himself isn't uh, capricious and needy and in need of our worship. You see, when you realize who the high God is and how great he is, and when you, when you behold that, it's logical then that you come to the conclusion that he is, of course, worthy of worship. That is the only proper and appropriate response to such a God. It isn't that he needs that worship. It isn't that it um, in any way adds to his being. He is perfectly exalted whether Stephen Hawking or any other physicist or even a believing scientist or you or I, whether we believe in him, whether we give our lives to him, whatever. It may affect many things in our life and experience and destiny. It doesn't change who God is. He is perfectly exalted above his creation. The Father, Son and the Holy Spirit we learn from the New Testament have dwelt in perfect fellowship since before the foundation of the earth. He has need of nothing. There's another really bad teaching that God um, made human beings and made the world because he was lonely and he wanted to know what fellowship with. If we understand the Trinity, that is bonkers because God had perfect fellowship. It is proof of his great love for us that that Christ... um, forsook something of the bliss of that fellowship to come and add to himself human nature in order that he might complete the work of redemption. But anyway, it's somewhat tangential to the revelation here, but important nonetheless. He is high, higher than anything else. He is exalted and in himself is satisfied and has need of nothing. He also bears a holy name. This is, um, it's as if he's entering here in the midst of the mess that the people are in and their pagan worship and he is pulling back the curtain and he is saying, look, remember who I am. Remember the nature of this great God who has called you to worship him, the Holy One, which the Jews would have understood had enormous connotations. It was an identity marker that their God was holy, that he was above the fray, that he was not in any way prone to sin, that he couldn't be tempted to sin that he couldn't be ever be evil or capricious, that he had a purity to his being. And not, so it's not just that he is great and high and exalted and above all, and that he is, that by extension means he is mighty in power, he, he holds the whole universe. It's not just that, but it's that he is, to add to all of that, morally pure and without blemish. God is showing up, reminding them of his credentials, of who he is as God. And it's supposed to be intimidating. We're supposed to, as we approach God in worship, remember his holiness and by contrast, our lack of it. And that is supposed to be awe-inspiring, that we are able to come into the presence of a perfectly holy God. And holiness is the idea of separateness. He is morally separate to anything we know or experience. And just again, this wonderful characteristic in verse 15, he who lives forever or he who inhabits eternity or he who dwells in eternity. God has come from his eternal dwelling and actually founded and created time and space, and he has a relationship to time that none of us can even come close to to imagining. It's clear from the scriptures that he is not bound by time. One day is as a thousand years to the Lord. He is not governed by his laws. And we cannot ever fully grasp this. But of course, why would God give us this revelation if it wasn't meant to teach us something about him and also fire our imaginations and our hearts and and again inspire awe as to the great nature of our God? He inhabits eternity and so God's experience is utterly unlike any of us or any other creature for that matter. There is a sense in which he of course intervenes in time. He dwells in all of time. He exists 
in every single moment that he does with us, and yet he does that without in any way being bound by that time. There is no way in which time puts a lock on God, where he ever runs out of time, where he ever has to do things according to any kind of timeline, yet though it may appear like that for us because we exist within it and we are bound by it. We grasp at the laws that God has made and we try to make sense of them and in some sense all our progress with understanding time and its relation to us and even how relative it can be in different parts of, in ways of the universe all of that is an infinitesimal piece of knowledge compared to the one who simultaneously dwells in our time and also in eternity. He is letting them know that he is fundamentally different from them because he dwells in eternity. That's, if you like, his throne, his exalted state is to be a God who is infinite. There is no finitude to him. He had no beginning. He will have no end. He was never young. He will never be old. It's so beautiful that he's given his people and us that revelation so that we can slow down and think about that. What a wonderful God we worship. Even to be given and granted that knowledge. And so we learn that he's high and exalted and also holy and dwells, his home in a sense, is in eternity. So what, what then possible link can there be if we get a picture of such a God and we conceive of him? What possible link can there be between such a God and the people of Israel lost in their pagan worship, completely worshipping the wrong thing, grasping at the wrong thing, trying to find God on the mountaintops. What kind of link can there be between such a God and the people in 21st century Scotland today? What kind of link can there be between such a God and you and me? This is such a powerful piece of scripture because the link to that is almost too good to be true and almost too inconceivable to be possible, and yet it is. He lives in this high and holy place, but also, but also with the one who is contrite and lowly in spirit. What does that mean? Literally, it's getting towards the idea of one who is broken. It's got the idea of someone who is smashed in lots of several pieces, who is so fragmented. And because of that fragmentation, because they themselves have been broken, it's left them a place where they're, they know they are in exact opposite place in relation to God. They know they are not high and exalted. They are, as God says, lowly and spirit. It should have echoes for us as New Testament Christians with the Sermon on the Mount. When Jesus says, blessed are the weak and those who mourn, especially for they shall be comforted. It's talking primarily about those who they may have been going along with the pagan worship of the nations and the cultures around them. They may have been going their own way. They may have been walking on a path of death and darkness and destruction. But by God's goodness and grace, perhaps even from considering who God is and his greatness, that has in a sense done its work. It has broken them. They have seen that he is a high and a great and a holy God and they are unworthy of the least of his mercies. They have seen that he would be justified in being enraged at them eternally for the fact that they've committed treason to this, the greatest high royal ruler in all the universe who they were made to worship. And it's a pattern we see in the Old and the New Testament. There's if you look at the pattern of the chapter, there's the sin and the waywardness. And then there's God breaking in to reveal who he is. And then he's saying, 
that actually affects people to realize who they are in light of him, but it produces the exact effect he's looking for. There's a paradox in Christianity, in knowing God, that it's the very people who say, God couldn't possibly love me. I couldn't know him. I am too broken. I am too weak. I am too damaged. My past is too checkered. Or perhaps the condition of my heart is so low just now. The condition of my faith is so small. The thoughts that cloud my mind are so dark and difficult. The amount of despair I feel, the amount to which I feel like giving up, um, all of that disqualifies me from the love of God. And this passage is here to remind us that the God of heaven calls to us and says, you are exactly who I am looking for. Those who have perhaps been broken in by life's experiences, by illness, by suffering, by loss, by bereavement, by the cruelty of living in the world in which we do, by the often rampant and injustice and fairness that can happen, whether it's in our workplaces, in our own families, or further afield. By the tiredness and weariness that can set in from life's experiences, sometimes one tragedy following another, following another with no let up, and it leaves us broken. And, and here's what God says to us through this passage. It, it is you, as you find yourself in that condition, un, uh, aware of your unworthiness of God's love or help, that is the meeting point. You see, God is two addresses. He does dwell in eternity and he inhabits the loftiest possible, conceivable dwelling. But he also dwells with us. And he especially dwells with those who are broken. God, the Psalms assure us, is near to the brokenhearted. Perhaps he is never nearer than when we are broken. You see, because he's attracted to it. God is, is attracted and drawn to repentant sinners. People who know they haven't got it all together. People who know they're not righteous. They're not good enough. They cannot make their own way to God. You see the, the contrast. The people in the earlier part of the chapter are running along the brooks and up the hills to try and make their own shrines and make their own way to God like every system and philosophy and false religion has ever done. And God is saying if you will stop all of that, if you will just realize and acknowledge your brokenness, that is how you will make your way to God. It doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel natural. It's contrary to all our instincts. But God would call us this morning, if that's where we find ourselves, trying to um, patch up and cover over the brokenness within us, hoping we can present ourselves to God. God would say to you, I can see through it all. Would you take all that down away, take the masks off and come before me in prayer and be real and acknowledge your need of me? Because that is what I am most attracted to. He dwells in unimaginable, unconceivable light and highness and holiness. But he also dwells with those who are contrite or broken and those who are lonely. Professor Donald McLeod says this passage is about those who have been led uh, through the terrible journey into self-discovery. Through the terrible journey into self-discovery. Sometimes we don't need to look to the worst news stories and the, the horror that goes on around us in the world. Sometimes for some of us, if we're honest, we are deep, complex beings that the most frightening thing we can be sometimes told to do is, is to look into ourselves and into our own hearts. There is all manner of, of evil and impurity in there. And there's a tendency for us to try to avoid doing that. And God is saying, if you want to know me, if you want to know blessing, that is what you need to do. But I won't leave you there. He does that. God gets no pleasure in seeing people broken before him for its own sake. To leave them there in a heap. This is the good news. This is the gospel. 
to revive the spirit of the lowly. That's the purpose for which he leads us on this journey and to revive the heart of the contrite. The heart and the spirit coming together in this passage to give the idea of the essence of one's life. God actually desires, as Christ tells us in the New Testament, He comes to give us life and to give us life in all its fullness. God does not want to leave us there broken in a million pieces. God uh, does not get a pleasure in seeing us fragmented and distorted. God came to restore the creation. God came, which is so badly broken by the fall. God came to restore sinners to himself, relationships, relationships. us amongst one another and also to mend their own hearts which are so distorted by sin and by the fall. He is in the business and with the chief interest of reviving spirits and hearts that are broken and and like a master potter or repairman bringing them back together again. That's the business that God is in. That's, you know, It's even fair to say from this passage that we find an Old Testament example of the idea that God has your good in mind. If you are called according to his purpose, God has your good in mind and he wishes to build you up and not leave you where you are. And you know, all of this is only possible because if we were to read earlier from Isaiah 52 and 53, we will see that There is one who has been broken like none of us who have ever been broken. There was one who was coming who would be God's servant, who would bear the iniquities of God's people, through whose wounds God's people would experience this healing and this wholeness and this revival, this reviving of their hearts with passion and love for God again. And that is more fully fleshed out for us as we then read forward in the Gospels and Jesus Christ and we see how he fulfills all those prophecies so beautifully and so perfectly. How he so willingly bears the wounds and the stripes and the lashes in order that the wrath and the anger, the justified anger of God might be satisfied. And that those who would take their refuge in this uh, Messiah would be able to know this direct relationship with God. You see, that's how it's possible, dear friends. And whatever you find yourself today as someone who's never tasted of that, who has tasted of it, but you're struggling now, one who has currently experienced brokenness, one who is currently experiencing refreshing and being revived, every one of us has a reason to look to God because if if he is the God who he discloses himself as in this passage, that high, that exaltedness, why would we not want to know him? It might be terrifying, but why would we not want to know him? And here is the heart of the gospel, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom all of us are chief, that God unsatisfied to stay in that unapproachable light and highness and exaltedness made a way through Christ that you and I could be the people he speaks of in this passage whose heart could be revived, whose spirit could be uplifted. May each of us this morning know that God by his Holy Spirit coming through Christ, wiping away our sins, dealing with what makes us so broken and reviving our spirits and our hearts in order that we might praise him. May he bless his word to us this morning. Amen. As we further worship God and respond in worship, um, there are several ways we normally do this. You're able to, as always, go onto our website, erskineparishchurch.com forward slash giving, and you're able to virtually in some way uh, contribute to an offering if that's how you wish to respond to God in worship. But of course, uh, we always gather our prayers of intercession at this time to call out to God for our needs. So let's once again draw near to God in prayer. Almighty and holy, high and exalted God, we bless you and lift up your name for who you are and the truth that you have shown us that we are able to approach you through Christ. We ask, O Lord, that you would visit and bless each of us with this knowledge for ourselves 
that we would all trust in Christ for forgiveness of sins, that we would know him entering our lives, mending what is broken, uh, restoring and reviving our hearts. We pray for our community, Lord, that this message of the gospel, wherever it's preached, in Erskine and throughout Scotland today, would revive broken hearts, of which we know there are many in our nation. Hearts broken through the separation that this virus has brought. Hearts broken through uh, fear and financial worry and strain. Hearts broken through the breakdown of relationships. God, there is not one of us who can say that we have no need of you, truly have no need of you. And so we ask you, Lord, to minister to those who find themselves in brokenness, who find themselves in unhealth, who find themselves uh, at the mercy of payday lenders. God, we pray that they would look to you and be helped and healed and revived. We pray, Lord, for uh, justice to prevail in our land, that those who oppress the poor, that those who take advantage, that uh, those who uh, look to malign the vulnerable in their care, that they would be brought to justice, that the scales would be brought before them, that you would hear the cry of the oppressed, whether that is victims of any kind of a physical, mental, emotional or sexual abuse, which we continually read as rampant, uh, both hidden and unhidden, that the cries would rise to the ears of God Almighty and you would intervene and bring justice on their behalf. We pray, O oh Lord, you would continue to bless and protect all our health care workers and those who sacrificially put themselves in harm's way. And we thank you for them. We pray that you would continue to help our governing leaders and authorities through this crisis and give them wisdom from on high. We pray for the good news to, uh, of a uh, leading vaccine, which has been uh, trialed and developed in our own shores in the United Kingdom, that the, this endeavour would be blessed by you and would continue to be fruitful, uh, that many lives may be saved, that even down to the great difficulties of the virus being curtailed, we pray that you go ahead of us. You continue to help us to be your church in the wake that lies ahead, to love and connect and serve with one another in whatever ways are possible, and to look to you, the high and holy one, to guide our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. And now may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest on you and remain with you both this day and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>